New York, 1856. The woman in the casket was dead. This was made painfully true by the collection of mourners in the room, a room that was specifically being used for the showing of the aforementioned dead woman and the fact she was lying in a casket with her arms crossed over her chest. Zachary Allen Willis, a ten-year-old, had never seen a dead body before. This one, it seemed, didn't want to stay dead. Zachary tugged at his father's suit jacket. His father ignored him and carried on the conversation he was having with the bespectacled man about the cost of the funeral. Zachary guessed the man was the dead woman's son. He seemed more upset at the departure of his money than his mother. Zachary looked back at the casket and it happened again. The dead woman's abdomen went up and down as if she were taking a breath. An old woman napping and nothing more. Zachary pulled at his father's suit jacket with more urgency. Zachary, don't be a pest, his father said dismissively. So Zachary stopped, and in the casket, the old woman continued to move. The movements were subtle at first, then her hand rose and grasped the side of the casket. Blood rushed to Zachary's head as the woman arose. Someone began to shriek in terror as the dead woman tumbled over the side. By the time Zachary realized he was the one screaming, it was too late. What happened next was a blur. London, 1879. Z snapped out of the dream with a cold sheen of sweat across his forehead. Disoriented by his strange surroundings, he stood and stumbled to the wall for support, to catch his breath, slow his heart rate. It was the same with every dreamed memory that crept up on him. This one took him back to the first time he'd seen a ghost. He pushed the memory aside and instead focused on his current situation. The sound of the wind outside as it billowed through sails. The creak of the mast. It brought it all back to him then. He was on a ship bound for London. He'd fled New York, away from the ghosts of his past. In London, he intended to start anew. It was a city filled with a rich history of ghosts and legendary creatures. It was here he would make his fortune. Here. He would set up shop and soon become the world's leading expert in ghost hunting. Z hefted his satchel over his shoulder and climbed to the deck. Night had fallen and he was surprised to see the great city of London looming in the distance. In his satchel, Z carried notebooks with many designs for equipment he'd need for his endeavor. His first priorities, once he hit the cobblestone streets, would be to find an engineer capable of bringing his designs to life and finding a place to set up shop. But where to start? The city looked huge and imposing from the ship. Being from New York City, Z was used to big cities. Nevertheless, it would take time to get his bearings. The more Z thought about it, the more he was sure a pub would be the first place to start. The pub was hazy with tobacco smoke. Z was familiar with some of the lingo from what he'd read in books, so stepped up to the bar and ordered a pint without sounding too much tourist-like. At least he didn't think he did. He sipped at the beer and surveyed the room. Two older fellows threw darts in one corner, while a group of revelers sang an old Irish ditty in another. Z smiled to himself. He felt at home already. The atmosphere was intoxicating. New in town, eh? An old man said from down the bar. He was bald with tufts of white hair over his ears and a big, bushy mustache to match. I am, just off the boat from New York City. An American, splendid. The man moved to the seat next to Z and held his hand out to shake. Allow me to introduce myself. Chester Thorig, Relic Hunter. Relic Hunter? Indeed. I own a small shop here in town. I'm always on the lookout for rare artifacts and ancient trinkets and such. That's very interesting. And what is it you do, my friend? I am a hunter myself. I hunt ghosts, capture them, remove them from homes and the like. Chester looked stunned. That is truly fascinating. I believe you and I meeting here in this pub is an act of fate. The old man amused Z. How so? I've come across a particular object that up until this point has been considered no more than a legend. Something so valuable and sought after that it's guarded by several powerful spirits. Z's interest was piqued though there was something about this man he didn't trust. What is this rare find you speak of? The magic mirror of Agnes Waterhouse. 
Chester Thorax said with a flourish of his hands. Z thought about this for a moment, then said, Never heard of it. Never, Chester said with clear shock and bemusement. Have you even heard of Agnes Waterhouse? I'm afraid not. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised, with you being American. Here's what I'll do. There's a woman on the other side of town that is the city's foremost authority on all things supernatural. Meet with her on the morrow. Learn all you can on the mirror and the woman who created it. If you're interested, here's the address to my shop. The old man slid a card over to Z. He then pulled another card from his pocket and wrote something down on the back with a pencil. And this is where you should go for more information. Z read the card. Lady Sylvia Brownstone was the name written there. Her address was printed beneath. Very well, I'll play along. Good. If you help me get this mirror, Mr. Ghost Hunter, I will pay you handsomely. Now you're speaking my language, Mr. Thoric. The following morning, Z found himself in a hired, horse-drawn cab with a slight headache from the previous night's pints given a pulse with every cobblestone hit on the street. There had been an inn only a block from the pub where Z had checked in and passed out. Now here he was, on the way to a stranger's house to pick her brain about a strange mirror. Well, you wanted more adventure, Z reminds himself aloud. And it was true. He had fled America on a whim leaving behind all the problems that plagued him. He had decided on a fresh start to build a career in a city with centuries worth of ghost stories. With his particular ability, Ghost Hunter Z would be known among Londoners in no time. The house the cab stopped in front of was massive. The grounds well manicured, the bushes in front of the house perfectly trimmed. Not a blade of grass was out of place. As Z climbed down from the cab, the door opened and an old woman stepped out. She looked the ghost hunter up and down. Z wore a 45 caliber revolver strapped to his hips and a Stenson on his head. Two fashion statements that were purely Wild West. The guns were a necessity. The hat? Well, he just enjoyed a good hat. The rest of his attire was purely New York City. The suit made the man. His father had instilled this much in him. If you've come looking for a showdown in the street, you're going to be greatly disappointed. Z gave her his best crooked, charming smile. I assure you, these guns are not meant for a lady, especially not one as lovely as yourself. The woman studied him, then said, You're full of it, but I like you. Come in, state your business. Z followed the woman inside where she asked just who his guns were meant for. Not who, madam, but what, Z answered. These revolvers are loaded with silver bullets. She turned to him and now seemed almost giddy. Now that's interesting. Do you hunt werewolves? There are all manners of creatures weak against silver. I merely use the guns as defense against them. The woman looked disappointed and Z quickly added, I, dear lady, am a ghost hunter. The exuberance returned. Really? Well, allow me to introduce myself. Lady Sylvia Brownstone. It is a pleasure to meet you, Lady Brownstone. I am Z. Just Z? Just Z. Well then, what brings you to my home, Z? I met a man last night that said I should seek you out for information. There is a mirror made by a woman named Agnes Waterhouse. Ah, yes. I am familiar. Come, let me show you to my library. Z followed Lady Brownstone to a set of double doors. When she opened them to reveal her library, Z was left breathless. The shelves were lined with volume after volume of supernatural text. Information on everything from hauntings to demon possessions. Lady Brownstone... I believe this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. You are welcome to use my library as much as you'd like, in exchange for stories of your hunts. That is a fair trade. Tell me, Z, what makes you qualified to hunt ghosts? Z hesitated at revealing his gift. It was often met with ridicule, but he sensed Lady Brownstone wouldn't react in the same way as others. I could see them. Come again? I have the ability to see ghosts. 
It came to me at a young age. They're everywhere. There came a point when I decided to stop being afraid of them and use this ability to my advantage. Financial gain. It must have been terrifying to experience that as a child. Z felt a strange gratitude toward her. His childhood was full of about a million memories he'd prefer to forget. Indeed, it, it was. The woman gave his arm a comforting pat and moved over to the bookshelves. Her hand moved along the spines with practice efficiency until she found the volume she was looking for. Ha! Huh, here we are. Witchcraft through the ages. The book was big, bound in leather, and seemed ancient. As Lady Brownstone opened it, Z was sure the yellowed pages inside would crumble to dust before she could manage to find any useful information. In 1566, Agnes Waterhouse became the first woman to be executed for witchcraft in England. She confessed to being a witch and admitted that her familiar was a cat named Satan. She was put on trial in Chelmsford, Essex, England, for witchcraft to cause illness to William Finn, among others, slaughter livestock and kill her husband. It was her own daughter's testimony that led to her conviction. She was hanged until dead, which they say took some time. Z rubbed the stubble on his chin in deep thought. Do you know anything about a magic mirror? Ah, yes. Agnes created the mirror and infused it with rare magic. They say it should be used to trap spirits or move through time, even grant wishes. Though the latter two would require secondary, far more rare and powerful artifacts to produce the desired magic. And Agnes used the mirror for these abilities. So the stories say she acquired wealth through time travel, determining routes where shipments of royal riches were shipped to other kingdoms and jumping through time to rob them. Some say she was able to appear right inside of the wagon that was carrying the loot. Of course, other sources say she was poor, that she struggled all of her life. The main purpose of the mirror, after all, was to trap the spirits of her enemies. You see, for Agnes, death wasn't enough punishment. She created an existence within the mirror that was pure torture for anyone trapped inside. Is the mirror real, or is it only legend? That depends on who you ask. Z laughed. I'm asking you, dear lady. Well, I'm one of those people that like to believe all supernatural things are real. Tell me, why all of these questions about Agnes Waterhouse's mirror? I met a man in a pub last night that claims to have found it. The old woman's eye lit up. Did he say where? No. He sent me here to get more information on the mirror from you. Who was this man? Chester Thorick. Ah, yes, the Relic Hunter. Well, if there's anyone who'd be able to dig it up, it would be him. And he has been here in the past to take advantage of my library. Just be careful, Z. He's been known to get dangerous when he has his eye on a prize. I appreciate the warning. Thank you for your time. Of course. It was a pleasure to have met you. Please, come back and tell me how things went. You have my word, Z said and kissed her knuckle with a bow. The two parted ways and Z climbed back into the cab. It was time to see if this relic hunter was telling the truth about his find. The little shop of rare artifacts was quaint and Z could see the space had potential, even though Chester Thorick didn't have a very big collection of artifacts. There was a glass display case running along the front of the shop, with little trinkets scattered here and there. What looked like a bull made by an ancient civilization sat next to a masterfully crafted dagger from a long dead member of the royal family. There was no particular order to these items, no structure. Z was certain he could do so much more with the place, if it were only his. The curtain opened and Thorek poked his head through. Ah, Ghost Hunter Z, I thought I heard the bell over my door ring. He came through the curtain and closed it quickly behind him. I keep a little flat back there, bed, bath, stove, fireplace. It's actually quite cozy. It sounds lovely. What impressed Z most is that the shop seemed to be absolutely ghost-free. Come, I have tea ready by the fireplace. We can discuss our objective in there. There was a still chill over Z from the late October air outside, and though he was more of a coffee drinker, a warm beverage by an even warmer fire sounded ideal. 
he followed the older man through the curtain into the apartment in the back. He was surprised by what he found there. Along the back wall was a steam-powered assembly line where mechanical arms went about brewing and pouring cups of tea. An arm with metal articulated appendages lifted the handle of a teapot on the stove. A conveyor moved the saucer with teacup into place and caught the boiling hot water. The teacups moved again to where dual-clawed hands dropped the tea bags in. Then they both moved along to the end of the belt, where they carefully pushed onto a table by a piston arm. What am I looking at? Z said, a sense of bewilderment washed over him. Oh, I dabble in mechanicals. Nothing so advanced as the Queen's research crew by any means, but it is wonderful what we can accomplish with the advancements in steam power these days. Here you are. He passed one of the saucers to Z and motioned for him to sit down in one of the two chairs near the fireplace. Z obliged. Between the two chairs were sugar cubes and cream upon a small round table. Thank you for your hospitality. Of course. I trust you had a productive meeting with Lady Brownstone. Yes, she is a delight. Oh, I agree, though she can be stern with some people. An odd comment. Z wondered if Lady Brownstone was stern with Thoric. She certainly didn't seem to trust him. She filled me on on Agnes Waterhouse in the mirror. You say you found it? Beneath the city, there's a massive network of sewer systems. I gained information from a gypsy that led me to believe that the mirror was hidden down there, somewhere. You see, decades ago, the mirror was among certain artifacts that were deemed too powerful to be lying about just anywhere. They were separated and hidden all over Europe, possibly even as far as Africa and the Middle East. Separately, the items are magical in their own right, but brought together, they could be made for great evil, or good depending on who should possess them. And what are your intentions for the mirror? Why, to sell it, of course. It would be a wonderful addition to my shop and the centerpiece of my collection. And what of these ghosts you say protected? How do you know about them? Why, I saw them when I tried to approach the mirror. Z knew then the man was lying, or perhaps he was merely mistaken. Mr. Thorik, would you please walk to the window with me? Thorik looked confused, but obliged nonetheless. In front of the window, Z pointed outside. Do you see the man there? The one walking aimlessly with his throat cut and the front of his shirt covered in blood. What? The old man said flabbergasted. Heavens no, where is he? He needs medical attention. Relax, Mr. Thoric. You can't see the man because he's a ghost. I can see him because I'm cursed with that ability. This leads me to believe that something other than ghosts are guarding that mirror. Can you describe what they look like? Skeletal. Not much flesh or skin left on their bones. Fingernails like talons. One was bald and the other had stringy black hair. They wore no clothing. Ghouls. I was leaning towards zombie before you mentioned the fingernails. Ghouls are far more dangerous. Both crave human flesh, but a ghoul is faster, smarter, and the claws make it a formidable adversary. There are three, you say? That's right. Z pondered this a moment and then said, uh, we shall have to stop by my room at the inn. I have the tools we need to defeat these creatures. Thoric's face lit up. Splendid! Inside the room at the Spaniard's Inn, Z dropped a large case on the bed and opened it. Inside were several cases of silver bullets. He pulled three out and dropped them on the bed. Next, he pulled out the pieces of a rifle and quickly assembled it. He handed it over to Thoric, who took it with uncertainty and then stood rigid as the ghost hunter stuffed his coat pockets with silver rounds. He instructed Thoric to take plenty as well. So I take it silver bullets will kill ghouls? Thoric asked. Any bullet will kill a ghoul, as long as she has a brain. Anywhere else on the body will have no effect. Silver bullets are all I have. I, I've never shot a gun before. I'll instruct you on the way. Z adjusted the old Stenson hat on his head. Shall we then? The carriage made its way along the cobble streets, the stench of the Thames growing stronger as they neared. The entrance to the sewers was a large drainage tunnel on the bank of the river. Z looked at the sludge at the foot of the tunnel with disgust. 
Uh, is there no other way to get to the mirror? If there is, I don't know about it. I've marked the walls from this entrance during my exploration. This is how I find my way back. Z pulled a handkerchief from his pocket and held it over his nose and mouth. Inside, the floor was slick and Z wished for a more suitable pair of shoes than the loafers he had on. I would have appreciated a warning about the state of this path we're taking, Mr. Thoric. Don't worry, Mr. Z. It gets better further in. Good. Although we will have to wade through knee-high water on one certain portion of our journey. Z stopped and stared at the relic hunter in disbelief. It's the sewers, Z. He turned and walked on. What did you expect? Z stepped forward, slipped, corrected himself, and continued cursing under his breath. After some time, the slick slime that covered the ground did dissipate and the two men found themselves walking on old cobblestone with the water flowing off to the left. They came to the first fork in the tunnel and Z noticed several symbols drawn on the wall in chalk. A star, a flower, a heart, and a diamond. It's the star shape we must follow, Thoric said. Each symbol is assigned to a different path I've taken while searching for the mirror. Thoric, how on earth did you come to the conclusion that it was down here? The gypsy I mentioned before told me a tale of an old witch who was charged with hiding the mirror, by whom I don't know. Nevertheless, the witch was told to hide it somewhere so that it would never be found. He told me he heard from several sources it was beneath London in the sewers. Though he didn't dare search for it, unbelievable power, old curses and such, if you believe that sort of thing. You don't? I am a man of science, dear Ghost Hunter. Spells and curses are a myth. The mirror's value is in its history and elusiveness. Don't tell me you believe in such things. After all I've seen, I believe in everything. Thoric stopped and looked back at him at this. That is an intriguing statement. You shall have to elaborate over drinks once we're finished here. If we get out of this alive, I'll tell you all you want to know. This seemed to make the relic hunter happy and they moved on. A left turn here, a right turn there. The path seemed to go on and on. Z was sure they'd walk several miles by the time they come to the area where the cobblestone was broken away and they had to wade their way through knee-high water. It was cold. Z groaned as it seeped into his expensive loafers. Thankfully, it didn't last long. Around another corner, the walk continued with a climb up a short ladder. Those squelching along in the wet loafers turned out to be far worse than being in the water. It isn't much further now, Thoric said. Thank heavens, Z returned. Two more turns later, Thoric slowed as he approached the next corner. It's here. Z carefully peeked down the next corridor. At the end, he caught sight of a tall object covered by a canvas sheet. Then, he leaned back and let out a frustrated sigh. What is it? Thoric asked. Thoric, we've walked miles through sludge and sewage water. Just how do you expect the two of us to get something that size back out? Thoric became flustered. I hadn't thought of that. You also didn't think to tell me how big this damn thing was. All this time, I was under the impression it was a handheld mirror. Blast! Thoric shouted. This was answered by a low growl. Z pulled the gun on his right hip and signaled to Thoric to stay quiet. He carefully looked back around the corner and saw movement from the shadows around the hulking form of the mirror. The dim light available in the corridor came from the moonlight falling through the grates on the streets above. The skeletal face that peered out at them from the darkness was feral, hungry, the ghoul pulled back as if it were satisfied there were no intruders. Z pressed his back against the wall, weighing his options. What do you think? Thoric inquired. We'll clear the ghouls out first, then worry about getting that thing back to the surface. Right, what should I do? Uh, hang back here. Use the rifle to kill them from afar. Aim for the head. You think you can do that? I'll surely do my best. Z nodded and stepped around the corner to face the mirror. Thoric. One last thing. Yes? Don't shoot me. Got it. The ghost hunter approached quietly. It seemed whenever he faced a threat such as this, his mind would drift back to that very first ghost he saw. The old woman, as she rose from her coffin, climbed over the edge and walked right through the room. Z blacked out, but when he came to and told his father about the apparition, 
Z was assured that it had all been a bad dream. After a while, Z believed him, until three weeks later when a dead man appeared at the foot of his bed and began to shriek. Focus. Both revolvers were in hand now. Behind him, Thoric was aiming a rifle in Z's general direction. With no more knowledge of shooting the damn thing than the short tutorials he had given him on the carriage ride, it was madness. Still, walking into danger, facing supernatural creatures, it wasn't about the money. That was just a fraction of it. It was the thrill. As the ghoul's screech had emerged from the shadows, Z knew it was about to thrill. He rushed forward, thumbing the hammers back on his guns. The first ghoul lurched towards him with claws outstretched. Z fired and the thing's rotted brain exploded from the back of its skull. Another ghoul leapt out. Another shot from Z's guns tore the top of its head off. It flopped back like the open lid of a cookie jar. Z stopped in his tracks at the sight before him. More movement from around the mirror. There were more than three ghouls. They poured out of the darkened doorway. Z retreated backwards. A rifle shot from Thoric hit one in the neck. Z finished it off with a slug to the head. He took another out, but so many were coming through the doorway, now they were falling over each other. Z fired his chambers empty and hoped like hell Thoric could keep the ghouls busy while he reloaded. Z narrowly avoided a swiping claw and fell back into the water below. Up on his knees, he quickly dumped the shells from each gun. A ghoul moved in for a bite of Z's shoulder, a rifle blast from Thoric, and the thing lost its head. The old relic hunter was really getting the hang of it. Z stood and set his revolver to blaze once more. A crash of the gunshots was deafening in the confined tunnel. Ghouls died one after another. Finally, Thoric dropped the last one. The calm afterwards was broken by the heavy ringing in Z's ears. He holstered his guns and turned back to Thoric. The old man stepped carefully around the corner with the rifle still at the ready, glancing at the dark shadows around the mirror. You think we got them all? He asked. There was a few more than three. Yes, that was my mistake. Well, let's get a closer look at our prize. Thoric gave Z a hand out of the water, and the two men inspected the mirror after removing the old sheet that covered it. The frame was beautifully carved, an intricate pattern of waves and a thick cherry wood. The surface of the mirror was flawless, not a single smudge or streak. Looking into it gave Z an odd, disoriented feeling, as though if he stared at his reflection long enough, the man in the mirror would begin to move of his own accord. He turned away with a shudder. <sighs> Perhaps we should keep the sheet over it. Agreed. After it was covered, they got to either side of it and lifted. It wasn't as heavy as it looked. Z was pleasantly surprised. They followed the star path back and after nearly two hours of walking and several breaks, Thoric motioned to Z to stop. Another break, Thoric? Asked Z. Come, Come now, we're nearly out. Yes, I believe I can handle it from here. Thoric pulled the rifle off his back and leveled it at Z's face. Suddenly, everything became clear. You only needed help carrying it this far. That's why I'm here. Nonsense. It's not the only reason. I couldn't have defeated all those things without you. Ah, but you were an excellent shot. Surely it's not your first time. No, I had an uncle that taught me how to shoot as a boy. So, you shoot me down here and dump me in the water, and if I'm found, no one will have any idea that it was you behind it all. Correct. Why? I'm being evicted, Ghost Hunter. I haven't the money to pay you for this job, nor can I afford to split the money I make off selling this mirror. I'm sorry, Z, this is purely business, no hard... Z's hand was a blur of movement. The revolver was out, cocked, and fired before Thora could finish his thought. The bullet hit the relic hunter in the chin and exited the top of his head in a spray of skull and pulp. Z had always considered himself more of a lover than a fighter. Hand-to-hand -hand combat had never been his forte. He was a hell of a marksman, however, and he was fast. As Thoric's knees buckled, Z reached out and pulled the rifle out of his hands. It was a gift from his father, and he didn't want to lose it. The body fell in the sewer water, but the ghost of the man stood in front of Z with a shocked look on his face. Sorry, Thoric, Z said with a shrug. You forced me to defend myself. Well, I suppose that puts an end to my problems. I suppose it does. Z, I know I have no right to ask you for a favor, but my relics are invaluable to me. 
I've spent my life collecting them. The landlord will arrive at my shop this morning. He will evict me, lock me out of the shop, and auction off my things. Z thought this was over, then said, All right, Doric, leave it to me. Z, besides the mirror, will you take anything from this experience? Yes, Z answered. Always get your payment up front. Z hauled the mirror the rest of the way out, leaving the bewildered ghost behind. Z returned to Thoric's shop, the mirror fastened to the roof of the carriage, to find the landlord of the building tacking an eviction notice to the door. Pardon me, sir, Z called as he climbed down from the bench. The landlord was a weasel of a man with a pencil-thin mustache and a bitter expression on his face. I'm Mr. Thoric's nephew. I just arrived from America. Yes, how does this concern me? Well, my uncle has decided to travel abroad on the search for more relics. He asked me to take over his shop. Really? Your uncle is three months behind his rent. Are you prepared to pay it up front for him? I am, as well as every month from here on. The landlord fixed a distrusting glare on the ghost hunter. Very well. You will sublet the space until the lease is up. Then I'll draw up a new lease in your name if you wish to stay. That seems more than fair, sir. I shall retrieve my belongings from the room I'd rented and pay you directly. The landlord gave a curt nod and removed the eviction notice from the door. Meet me back here in an hour. I'll have papers for you, son. Z agreed to this and turned to take the short ride to the inn. He had to admit, though he'd already been forced to kill a man, his trip to London was a successful one. He'd already landed a shop with a built-in flat, a horse and carriage, and a rather valuable magic mirror. Of course you know, the landlord called to him. Your uncle's shop is a colossal failure. That's why he couldn't pay me. I hope you aren't expecting the fare any better. The shop will be no more than a hobby and location to build upon my true calling. And what might that be? Z smiled. I'm a ghost hunter.